Hello, free people of the Rocky Mountain region, and welcome to this Free State Colorado interview. Today, I'm joined by Ian Escalante, Director of Operations for Rocky Mountain Gun Owners. Ian, I hope you are well, and thank you for joining me today. Of course, Brandon. It's good to be back. I quite enjoy Free State Colorado, and I hear that uh, El Paso County Liberty on the Rocks is kicking back off again, so I look forward to going down there next week, and it's good to be back talking to the people of the great state of Colorado. Yeah, it's pretty exciting, Ian. We have a, a growing liberty movement, a growing liberty community here in Colorado. It's pretty exciting. There's meetups pretty much every single week. There's so many people getting activated, so many people interested, and especially because it's a big election year, I think that's getting a lot of people motivated to get involved and do something. So I'm excited today to talk about the primary election coming up here at the end of June and talk about who are some of the gun rights champions, who are some of the pro-gun candidates running for office that people should consider supporting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very glad you asked that. As I came on here a couple weeks ago to discuss the disaster that was the legislative session, <clears throat> and Governor Jared Polis actually signed the last of the gun bills last Friday, House Bill 1353, which creates a new uh, licensure scheme for gun dealers across the state of Colorado. So we're really seeing him crack down. We're seeing Jared Polis and the Democrats really cracking down and trying to strangle the gun industry here in the state of Colorado. So it's so important that one, I mean, we have to kick out Democrats. That's obviously needs to be our number one priority, but, and this is where uh, RMGO comes in. It is important that the people that we kick the, the, the Democrats that we kick out, that we are replacing them with people who are actually going to fight on our issue. We don't need people who are just going to go in and vote against the gun bills. That's like saying that you want to raise because you showed up because you show up on time to work. You're doing the the very, very bare minimum, voting against absolutely extreme violations of the Constitution. That doesn't make you a pro-gun champion. What makes you a pro-gun champion is that you're someone who goes out there. Not only do you vote the right way, but you also force votes. You also force people on the record. You use procedural tricks to try to, uh, you know, stonewall a lot of these bills. And I think uh, as Dudley Brown said it best, a champion is someone who plays on a team with a coherent plan. And that's what we need. We need people who are not just going to vote against <clears throat> these insane measures, but we really need people who are going to play on our team. Playing on our team means all those things I just mentioned, but also sponsoring repeals of gun control. We have not seen a magazine, repea uh, magazine ban repeal bill I think since 2016 or 2017, there may have been a couple filed in between them, but the last time we really had a, a vote on a magazine repeal bill was 2016, or magazine ban repeal bill. We have not seen any bills to repeal a lot of the garbage that was passed last year with the three-day waiting period, the home manufactured firearm ban. And then this year, we have seven other bills that got ran, or six bills and one ballot measure. But six other bills that have been rammed down our throat, and now we need to start working to repeal that. And people say, well, you're in a blue state. You're never going to have the votes. It doesn't really matter. We need to be waving our flag. You look at states that are hard red, you see Democrats still sponsoring their Democrat priority bills, whether it's uh, gender-affirming care for children, whether it's assault weapons ban, whether it's universal health care. Their partisan, the partisan makeup of their state has never deterred them from running these bills because they are hell-bent on changing the partisan makeup of that state by waving their flag, by saying, hey, you know, we're going to, this is what we want to do if you give us power. We need to be waving that flag for gun owners. Too many times Republicans, when they're in the minority, they say, oh, no, we can't touch any of that because we need, we need to show that we're reasonable so that we can get our majorities back. We saw this thing with Obamacare. They said, you know, we, we're not going to sponsor an Obamacare repeal because the, the House is Democrat, the Senate is Democrat. We're not going to do it. 2010, Republicans take the House. All By the way, all running on repealing Obamacare. When push comes to shove, they say, nope, can't repeal Obamacare because it'll pass the House, but it'll never pass the Senate because the Democrats control the Senate. 2014 comes along. Republicans take back the Senate. What do they say? Oh, we can't do an Obamacare repeal bill because the uh, Obama is still in the White House. So we need to elect a Republican president in 2024. 2016 comes, Donald Trump gets elected. 
Uh, he gets inaugurated. And the first thing, what was one of the first things President Trump said he would do whenever he got elected? Repeal Obamacare. Well, now the Republicans control the House, the Senate, and they have a president who is fully on board with getting rid of Obamacare. And what did House, House and Senate Republicans do? They didn't kill Obamacare. They didn't repeal Obamacare. They had this initial repeal bill, which then they turned into a skinny repeal where it just watered down Obamacare a little bit. And then when push came to shove, John McCain made that infamous thumbs down vote in the Senate. One of the last uh, Senate votes he took as a senator was to kill the Obamacare repeal. So we can't we can't do this anymore. We can't do this anymore. Then, you know, in 2018, the Democrats take back the House and then it's uh, it's split power again. So we can't we can't do this anymore. When we have power, even if we don't have power, we need to be flying our flag. And the only way we will get power, the reason why Republicans get their majorities back, the reason why they have electoral victories is because people are sick and tired of what the Democrats are doing and they want to see change. And what we're doing is we're looking for the candidates who we can actually trust that say, yes, I want to see change, but that aren't just going to blow smoke up our skirts, but are actually going to go and force the change that that needs to happen, force these repeal bills. So we have a very, very long, in-depth vetting process for all these candidates. They have to fill out a survey 100 percent. Most of the time, we require them to go to one of our uh, political courses. That's done by the Foundation for Applied Conservative Leadership so they can understand our model a little bit better and they can start to really study it, become familiar with it, and marry themselves to that formula. And then even if they fill out a 100% survey, we're still going to sit down and we're going to do an, uh, an interview with them, whether it's in person or over the phone. I did most of those interviews this year. <clears throat> and then we're really going to figure out, okay, is this person, is this person really going to go up there and do what they say they're going to do? Are they really going to do it or are they just are they just pretending because they want to get elected uh, off the coattails of Democrat displeasure? So that's really what we look for. And we have made several endorsements in the primary. What I'm going to do is we're we'll go on the website. There are going to be a couple general endorsements that I'm just going to skip over. I think probably post primary, we can sit down and talk about the general endorsements I'll maybe give a very brief summary, but I really want to focus on the primary because we don't have too much time. And the primary is, at, in, I think it's 13 days from now at this point. Yeah, we're 13 days away from the primary. People are already voting. So I really want to focus on those primary endorsements. Yeah, 100%. Ian. I think it's really important that the right kind of candidate gets elected, right? It, it'd be great if you could trust that all Republicans are going to be 100% pro-gun champions, but unfortunately, that's not the reality. A lot of these people are not really ideologically driven to support our constitutional or God-given freedoms. Uh, it's really unfortunate, but it's important that organizations like you and others out there are really – checking the records, checking and vetting these candidates and saying, you know, are they going to be what we expect them to be? Do they deserve our vote? Are they going to stand up for these issues and ideas that we believe in as freedom loving Coloradans? Right. So absolutely. Let's jump on the website here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. We're going to mm -hmm. rmgo.org. So people can follow along at home. rmgo.org is your uh, well, one-stop shop here. So when you click on there, uh, you'll see these banner images that rotate through. Uh, you you want to find the one. Uh, there's the renewals for membership, of course, the legal fund. Uh, join today. Some more information there. Uh, the bill watch, which we talked about last time, the banquet. Um, and then, of course, the uh, official endorsements here from the PAC, from Rocky Mountain Gun Owners PAC. So the Political Action Committee, you just click there or go to rmgo.org slash endorsement. And you're going to find this list uh, if you want to reference it later. So perfect. So uh, we'll, it's organized here. looks like state house, state Senate, local races and district attorney. Uh, I guess we go through some of these state house candidates, Ian. Sure, sure. So the, the guy at the top of our list is Representative Scott Bottoms from House District 15. Now, Scott, he was elected in 2022. He actually replaced uh, Dave Williams. So Dave Williams was previously in that seat in Colorado Springs, Scott replaced him. Scott has been an overall champion throughout the entire time that he's been in there. He has stood, stood fast with 
gun owners across the state of Colorado. He stood for the Second Amendment, and he has also done those things that I mentioned. He plays on the team. He runs our plays. And he also goes up there and he's not afraid to force votes. He's not afraid to talk for an hour and, and run the clock out. He really, really genuinely believes and fights for our Second Amendment right. Now, he's going to have a fairly easy primary being an incumbent. I actually don't even know if he has a primary challenger. Um, but he he's very safe. He won outright at the assembly. He will be back and he's in a very safe district. So we don't have to worry about Scott Bottoms going anywhere. But we are endorsing him. We are putting our stamp of approval on him that he is not even 100 percent. I would say 100,000 percent a pro-gun champion who will do what must be done. He is probably one of the strongest votes we have in Denver right now. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. Representative Bottoms has been a, a champion for liberty, one of the top rated liberty legislators down there. So really excited to see that endorsement. So let's move of on course. here. Sure. Our, our second endorsement there, that's uh, Rebecca Kelty. She won her primary outright, and she's going to be taking on Stephanie V. Hill in the general election. So that'll be one that we'll, we'll get into her a little bit more once we get through the primary. She is 100 percent pro-gun, though, has filled out a survey and will be a breath of fresh air compared to Stephanie V. Hill, who did cast a vote in favor of the assault weapons ban. Yeah, in uh, House District 16, I mean, it's one of the top targets, I think, for Republicans to flip in the state legislature. I get on my whiteboard right behind me. Uh, House District 16, Stephanie V. Hill won by 710 votes, 710 votes two years ago. So definitely one of the most winnable seats for a Republican to kind of reverse that tide, so we defeat one of these anti-gun legislators. So really excited to see uh, Rebecca Kelty take that opportunity and, and hopefully defeat V. Hill come November. Absolutely. And as you'll see, moving on down here, we have Representative Ken DeGraff in House District 22. He is also an incumbent. He's from the neighboring district to Scott Bottoms. He has also been a 100% pro-gun champion. And he's even taken that final step and run pro-gun bills. And run bills, even though he's in a overwhelmingly Democrat legislature, he was 1,000% opposed to everything he stands for. He still ran the Second Amendment Preservation Act as one of his very first bills in the state house last year. This year, he ran a bill to abolish civil asset forfeiture or at least greatly reform it. And the bill didn't make it out of committee, but he still flew that flag. He still fought hard. We supported that bill 100 percent. Unfortunately, some Republicans who are beholden to the I would call big law enforcement uh, opposed that bill and, and actually played a big part in killing that bill, unfortunately. But we he has our 100 percent support. He is also in a fairly he's in a very safe district. Uh, he won outright at assembly. So we are very happy that Ken DeGraff will be back in Denver come January 2025. And these are the type of people that you're looking for. If you want to if you were to ask if someone were to ask you, what's an RMGO endorsed candidate? Give me what give me an example of what an RMGO endorsed candidate looks like, I'd say look no further than Ken DeGraff. Oh, definitely. Ken DeGraff is a great legislator, a true statesman, somebody who believes wholeheartedly in liberty and the Constitution. Also one of the greatest voices we have fighting back against some of this climate hysteria. Uh, you know, he's an airline pilot. You want to talk to him about carbon emissions and uh, greenhouse gases, you know, give yourself a couple hours because he is one of the most well-informed, educated people on that topic. So uh, really happy to see this endorsement. Definitely a champion and a leader down there at the state legislature. Absolutely. House District 26, that's going to be another one of our general endorsements. Um, moving down to House District 39, we have Representative Brandy Bradley. Brandy is cut from the same cloth as Ken DeGraff and Scott Bottoms. She is likely to win her primary. Uh, I don't believe her opponent has raised any money at all. She has was one of the very few people, every single gun bill, she got up there and she would talk. She wouldn't talk. She would yell from the well about what an infringement this is. And she really gave another perspective, too, because she was able to give the woman's perspective of firearms. You see moms demand action in every town in Colorado cease fire. They try to dominate the space 
with their women and say that, oh, you know, women, so women don't like guns. Guns are scary. Gun lead, gun, gun violence is female violence, whatever they try to come up with. Brandy actually gave a solid, concise perspective by saying, listen, I'm a woman. I work in the medical industry. She's a physical therapist. She said, I, I work late at night. I have to work at hospitals and I have to walk into, into parking garages. I mean, you see health is in Aurora, which is not a good area. And you have young women who are studying to be doctors or physical therapists walking back to their cars at night. And now you're telling them that you they no longer can carry a firearm on a college campus. So she really has shown that from a woman's perspective as, listen, not only is gun control wrong and unconstitutional, but realistically, you're taking away the equalizer. Firearms are an equalizer to where a woman with a firearm is less likely to be harassed or abused because she has that equalizer and can easily and readily defend herself. And that's something that some of these people, some of these idiots, absolutely insane, just did not understand or they just completely threw out. I, I mentioned on the last podcast, Representative Mandy Lindsay said that women with firearms are going to be more raped than women who don't have firearms. The crazy stuff like that could pulling out completely false statistics and quite frankly, just being kind of insulting saying that, Oh, you know, if you, if you're a woman and you want to carry a gun to defend yourself, you're stupid. That's absolutely insane. And it really shows the disdain that the Democrats have for us, for us as individuals and for our Liberty and our ability to defend ourselves. Brandy has been a solid pro gun voice. We are very happy to endorse her again. And I'm, I'm very excited to see her get reelected. Definitely. Yeah. Representative Bradley, one of the most outspoken, bold members of the legislature, definitely uh, an outspoken, I can't repeat that enough, advocate for liberty, not afraid to back down from any fight. Uh, really happy to have her down there. Love this endorsement. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now we actually are getting down to some of our contested primaries. So House District 43, that is currently held by Representative Bob Marshall. You've heard me use his name almost like a swear word throughout the entirety of session. Bob Marshall, while he did vote against the assault weapons ban and did vote right on a lot of stuff, he voted wrong on a lot of stuff. He was a deciding vote that allowed the gun licensure bill to get out of committee. Mark Snyder, the chair of the House Finance Committee, opposed that bill. All Bob Marshall needed to do was concur with him and we could have killed that gun licensure bill. And the crazy part is Bob Marshall voted against it on the floor. He was the deciding vote to get it out of committee, but to cover himself, he went on ahead on the floor and voted against it. So it is abundantly important that we replace Bob Marshall. This is probably going to be the easiest pickup because this is an R plus five district. Bob Marshall got elected, honestly, on a miracle. Uh, Republicans had a bad year in 2022, and he was able to ride that co those coattails, and he only won by less than 500 votes. So with uh, you know the presidential year coming up and with a lot of people really fed up and sick of what's going on with the Democrats in Denver, this is our best shot to kick out someone who's voted against our gun rights. Now, with that being said, we're entering into our contested primary for House District 43. And by the way, it, it is on the graphics, but we're, we're kind of trying to put the regions that these people are running in. So House District 43 is the entire city limits of Highlands Ranch. It cuts into Lone Tree a tad bit, but 99% of the district is just within the Highlands Ranch city limits. So... Pretty Republican leaning. It is in Douglas County. This is the first time a Democrat's held this seat in a very, very long time, if not ever. So the two people that we have going against each other in this primary are Matt Burcham, who we have endorsed. Matt Burcham is a business owner. He's a local. He's a family man. He's very involved with the community. He has filled out a 100% survey. He has pledged that he is going to run pro-gun bills. He's going to run repeals against this gun control and he is going to be a champion not just for gun rights but also for liberty across the board he is very much has i want the government leaving me alone type of mindset and he's uh, in, again cut from the same cloth as people like ken de Graff, scott bottoms and brandy bradley and he is going to be squaring off with laura thomas who is a current douglas county commissioner 
Laura Thomas has failed to fill out a survey. She did not return a, a, an RMGO survey. And she is also married to Tony Fabian, who is uh, the former president of the Colorado State Shooting Association. Colorado State Shooting Association is the NRA's state affiliate here in Colorado, one of their multiple state affiliates that they have here. It's the main one. Well, back in the early 2000s, um, this is a, a Dudley Brown war story. Uh, Tony Fabian and the Colorado State Shooting Association were opposing shall issue concealed carry. So not not constitutional carry, not permitless carry, but they were they were opposing a full clean preemption and shall issue concealed carry. That is the and that was a big issue. And Dudley and him squared off very, very aggressively uh, over two decades ago now. Laura Thomas is married to this guy. She also, as I mentioned, did not fill out an RMGO survey. Uh, she was sent a survey. Every candidate for House was sent a survey, except for the ones who declared very, very late in the game, but she declared early. She never filled the survey out. So we sent a mailer in the district informing Republicans in House District 43 that Laura Thomas had failed to put down in writing her stance on pledging to sponsor a repeal of red flag gun confiscation, to force a recorded vote, even if establishment party leadership opposes it, to oppose all gun control, to sponsor constitutional carry. All of these questions on our survey, she failed and refused to fill out. And of course, she went ahead and, uh, and filled out the NRA survey, but she didn't fill out ours. Well, when we sent that mailer, she sent out in her newsletter accusing us of being a dark money group who uh, claiming that we are the best thing that has ever happened to the Democratic Party because we are so extreme and aggressive and mean that we are actually the reason why Colorado is turning blue, not limp-wristed Republicans who stand for nothing and have caused – uh, hundreds of thousands of voters to go on affiliate. No, that's not the problem. The problem is the people who are standing up for the Constitution and standing up for people's rights. And that was what she put in her newspaper. So a vote for Laura Thomas is a vote for the continued status quo of limp-wristed Republicans that we've seen permeating the legislature over the last decade. And we cannot have any more of that. And the problem is, is as easy as it should be to beat Bob Marshall, someone like Laura Thomas would be the best thing to ever happen and would probably hand Bob Marshall re-election on a silver platter. So Matt Burcham is the pro-gun candidate. He is the champion. If you live in Highlands Ranch, I strongly encourage you to vote for Matt Burcham. Wow. Well, I really appreciate that background. I had no idea, you know, not uh, not too plugged into Douglas County uh, politics. So really interesting information there. And I had to consult my whiteboard uh, a few minutes ago here, but it was 405 votes, 405 votes that Bob Marshall won. Definitely the most winnable district in the state legislature for Republicans to be able to flip a seat, get a gun grabber out. So uh, interesting to see what happens there. We'll see uh, a very interesting primary battle as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So moving on, we uh, pretty much most of our primary races are centered in Douglas and El Paso counties. Those are, as of now, the high density areas that are still fairly strong Republican areas, Douglas County and uh, Douglas County. So Castle Rock, Highlands Ranch, Parker, Lone Tree, Larkspur. And obviously, El Paso County, Colorado Springs, there's still a lot of very strong conservatives that live there and, and pro-gun, pro-liberty people. So we're getting involved in a lot of those primaries because the Democrats in Denver, they've sent their most aggressive far-left warriors to represent their most far-left districts. You have Elizabeth Epps, you have Tim Hernandez, you have Lorena Garcia that are flying the flag of the farthest left of the Democrat party. So it is so incredibly important that we secure our strongholds and we have people who are going to be the champions of liberty coming out of the strongest, most conservative districts. That is so important. It, it, we can't really, we can't 
go after the Democrats and we can't defeat them until we get our house in order. And in order to get our house in order, we have to elect good, strong pro-gun champions. So that brings us down to House District 45. Uh, House District 45 is currently held by Lisa Frizzell, Representative Lisa Frizzell. She is running for Senate District 2. Uh, Jim Smallwood's vacated seat. We're actually endorsing in that race. We're going to get to that a little bit later. And in this race, we see Bill Jack, who is the RMGO endorsed candidate, facing off against Max Brooks, a current uh, Castle Rock Town Councilman. Now, Bill Jack ran in 2022. He primary challenged Lisa Frizzell. We endorsed him then. He has filled out a 100% survey. And Bill Jack may actually be a stronger champion than some people, than Ken DeGraff or Scott Bottoms. He is truly the probably the strongest candidate that we're endorsing this, uh, this election. He is 100% pro-liberty. He is 100% pro-gun, no questions asked. The Second Amendment shall not be infringed. He, uh, I was actually told, he, he told me a story one time about how he was knocking on doors and uh, he was talking to voters about how they should be able to park tanks in their driveway. So this guy is a true, true champion. Now, Max Brooks is someone who, he is currently on the Castle Rock City Commission. Um he has filled out a 100% survey, but Max Brooks has some issues where he has capitulated to the radical left before, specifically on things like uh, gender and tra and uh, erotic shows for children. Those were some, there was a, a major vote in Castle Rock last year where he, he caved and he allowed a erotic show for children at the Douglas County Fairgrounds to be permitted, or rather he didn't vote against pulling the permit or instructing Douglas County to pull the permit. And now, of course, we're a gun, we're gun organization. I care about a lot of issues, and sometimes I get a little bit off the reservation. But the re our reasoning for this endorsement is very simple. If Max Brooks caved while he was a member of the Castle Rock City Council, what is to say that he is not going to cave when he gets up to the state house? Capitulation is something that can be universal. If someone capitulates on an issue they ran on, he ran on stopping woke. He ran on, you know, fighting to protect family values in Douglas County. If they're willing to do that at such a small level uh, as city commission, I'm not sure they can be fully trusted not to capitulate whenever they get to the big times, when they get to the state house. What's going to happen in the 11th hour when leadership comes to them and says, hey, you need to vote for this uh, this common sense gun reform. Now, I'm not – Max Brooks has never taken a bad vote on guns, but I will say the capitulation was a big concern for us. And plus the fact Bill Jack is just such a strong champion for the Second Amendment that he is the clear choice in this race, and we're backing him 100%. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, we'll see what happens down in Castle Rock, Douglas County. Uh, a lot of room there for some growth in the Liberty movement, I think. Uh, you know, definitely, like you said, the pro gun champions need to come from those more conservative areas and really be the people that are going to push the issue forward and not back down for sure. Of course. So moving down to House District 60 um, down in Fremont, for those of you who don't know where that is, that is in the area between Pueblo and uh, Gunnison. So that whole area, the northern part of the San Luis Valley, when you're getting a, a little bit southwest of Colorado Springs, that's the area that Stephanie Luck is running in. Uh, she was elected back in 2020. She is a solid pro-gun champion. She did have a baby, so she wasn't at uh, session as much as she usually is. But she's someone who has our full support, again, going into the primary and the general. Oh, yeah. Representative Luck, definitely with the Liberty leaders down there. Uh, top rated on all the scorecards, all the different Liberty scorecards that come out. Definitely a champion. Always pushing the issues forward. So really excited to see her return next year. Absolutely. House District 62, this is going to be a general endorsement. Uh, Carol Riggenbach is taking on Representative Matthew Martinez. Now, Matthew Martinez has been one of the better Democrats on the gun issue. 
but nonetheless, he still voted wrong. He's he's voted for some gun control, and a vote for one piece of gun control might as well be a vote for all of it. So we're endorsing her. She is 100% pro-gun, and that's going to be a name that you should be looking for if you live down in the San Luis Valley. Uh, it's a really weird-shaped district, so it's the San Luis Valley, so San Luis, Alamosa, um, I believe Salida is cut in there a little bit, Monta Vista, and then it kind of, there's a little arm that cuts off that goes all the way up to Pueblo West. That's a more Democrats-centric uh, district, but also it is a district with a lot of gun owners. And that is the reason why Matthew Martinez and his Democrat predecessor, Don Valdez, Don Valdez actually was a almost 100% on the gun issue. I believe he was one of the Democrats to vote against red flag when it first passed in 2019. Don't quote me on that, but I'm 99% sure he did. Uh, that district has always produced people who are are solid on the gun issue because it is a very rural area. There's a lot of gun owners. It, it borders New Mexico. You're really, I mean, that's that's old Colorado right there. Nothing but ranches and mountains and farms. It's a really beautiful area if you haven't been down there. So we we are supporting her 100. percent And uh, if you live down in that area, definitely look for that name on your November ballot. Yep, that's uh, you know, Alamosa County, Rio Grande County, Mineral, Sawatch, Conejos, and Castilla, and part of Huef uh, I can't say that, but part of Pueblo County for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, where from County. So, uh, yeah, that down down there in that part of the state, definitely look for this name going forward. Absolutely. So now we're getting towards the end of our state house endorsements, and this is uh, House District sixty five. Now, House District 65 is currently held by Representative Mike Lynch. He was the former minority leader until it came out that he had a little incident where he was driving under, under the influence and got arrested. Uh, he's now running for Congress. He's running against Lauren Boebert in Congressional District 4. And this district actually is up by you. And it is a, it is, uh, I think, about northwestern Weld County. So... Eaton, all the way down towards Greeley, and then all the way out towards Timnath, uh, up to Wellington, all the way out to LaPorte, even has a little bit of Loveland and Johnstown carved into it. Uh, this might be the most conservative district in the state. This is a, I want to say it's like an R plus 30. No Democrat oh. will ever win this seat. Now, there's been some controversy over this uh, endorsement, and I, I want to kind of put some of the uh, fears to bed here or the concerns. Lori Garcia Sander is running against Trent Lisey. Now, Trent Lisey was in the he was the first person to hop in the CD4 race, I actually ran into primary challenge Ken Buck, and he is kind of known for his uh, flashiness. And the uh, flashiness and also his uh, loyalty to President Trump. Those are really the big things that he is known for. So a lot of people in the grassroots sphere have begun to support him because he, he does talk the talk of a grassroots candidate. But when we dive a little bit deeper into Trent Lisey and who he is and what he's done, we find some very disturbing things. So first off, Lori Garcia Sander has filled out a 100% survey. She is going to be solid. The gun issue is not her number one top issue. There are some people who are, um, they have their issues. You know, she's a, a she's going to be a huge champion for school choice, which I think is also incredibly important. It's not an issue we take a stance on, but it's very important. But she will be 100% on the gun issue. She will be a good vote. She will do what must be done. And I believe that she is someone and will be an upgrade for House District 65. Now, Trent Lisey, on the other hand, he has a very sordid history. So the biggest thing is when he was, I believe it was back in 2017, when he was running for Weld County School Board, he was arrested for participating in an illicit interaction with a minor. So he was arrested on two accounts. One was of child abuse and the other was a harassment charge involving a strike, kick, or punch of a minor. You can go ahead and find that article on the Greeley Tribune. 
he was arrested. He pled guilty. He was he had some sort of criminal penalties. One of the he did plead down one of those charges, but it, it still stands that he was arrested and pled guilty to engaging in an illicit and violent interaction with a minor. That's a serious problem. That's very, very concerning. That's not when we have people who are actively trying to target and groom and sexualize our children. The last thing we need on our side is someone who has a sordid history involving minors. And that's something that we just cannot afford to have on our side. In addition to that, he has been kind of vague about his his uh, stance on the Second Amendment. When he ran for Congress, he mentioned he wanted to get rid of the ATF. But now if you go to his state house website, it just says, I fully support the Second Amendment and I had a gun store endorse me. He leaves a lot to be desired. And he also refused to fill out our survey. We sent him a survey when he was running for Congress and he never filled the survey out. So we have a guy who with no voting record Little to no history other than running around and, you know, taking trips to Mar-a-Lago and taking pictures. And there was also some videos that came out of him uh, doing cocaine with strippers. And the, the guy has a very sordid past and he's not not someone who I would trust, who I believe is stable enough to champion our rights. Maybe he talks a good talk. I don't know, but we don't know this guy. No survey, no solid stance on things like red flag gun confiscation, no pledges on sponsoring pro-gun legislation. It really seems like he's running simply to be elected, and he's run for many other offices before. So Lori Garcia Sander is definitely the candidate you're going to want to get behind if you live in House District 65, that northern well to uh, northeastern Larimer County. Wow, interesting. Yeah, very interesting. We'll see what happens up there, but uh, keep an eye on that one for sure, people. So that's what we got for State House here from RMGO. Uh, taking it, let's flip over to State Senate. Absolutely. All right, Ian. Yeah. Tell us so, about these candidates here. Of course. So the two state Senate primaries we're endorsing in, we are seeing two veteran legislators, two veteran senators vacating their seats due to term limits. House uh, Senate District 12, we have Senator Bob Gardner, who's been in, I think, I believe he first got an office in 2008. Um, he is turned out. He's vacating his seat. He's pretty well up there in age and he's retiring from politics. And the other one we see is Senate District 2, which is uh, also a Douglas County seat. That's Parker and Castle Rock and pretty much the whole northeast corner of Douglas County. That is being vacated by Senator Jim Smallwood. Senator Smallwood was a very, very strong ally when it came to defending the Second Amendment. He stood up there many, many times over the session and actually fought hard. So I'll, we'll go ahead and start with Senate District 12, and then we'll, we'll move back down to Senate District 2. Both of these are two of the hotly contest, two of the most hotly contested primaries that we are seeing this election cycle. So Adriana Cuva is running for Senate District 12, and it also should be noted that Mark Snyder, Representative Mark Snyder, is running for Senate District 12. Now, when Senate District 12 was redrawn, it went from being a very safe Republican district to being a very competitive district with a slight Republican lean. So there is, it is not out of the question if Mark Snyder campaigns well and plays his card right, cards right, that could be a Democrat pickup, and that's something we really can't afford right now, especially in the situation that we're in. So Adriana is an activist. She's a mother. She is, has been involved with the Republican Party down in El Paso County. She is running as the grassroots candidate. She is running to actually make change in Denver. And she is filled out a 100% survey. She has passed our vetting. I went and met with her when I first heard she was considering running for office. She is going to be a champion, not just for the gun issue, but also for every other issue that regarding liberty that we care about. But she is the 100% pro-gun candidate. And once again, she is the only candidate in that race to return a survey for Rocky Mountain gun owners. Now, her opponent 
is a gentleman by the name of Stan Vanderwerf. He is a current El Paso County Commissioner, and he is also the president of the Pikes Peak F sorry Pikes Peak Firearm Coalition. Reason I call it the Pikes Peak FUD Coalition is because they uh, decided to have George Brockler come as their keynote speaker a couple months ago, and we're going to get we're going to spend a little bit of time on George Brockler here in a second. So Stan Vanderwerf is running that group. Um, he has actually trashed RMGO's lawsuits. He has said that they are fake, they are uh, they're not substantial, and that we are are scamming our donors by uh, with these scam lawsuits. Okay. On top of that, again, hasn't returned a survey, and the biggest problem is that I have heard from multiple of. Uh, voters and RMGO members and uh, voters and constituents down in Senate District 12 that this guy has been running around saying he's going to file a constitutional carry bill to put a bunch of gun control in it so the Democrats vote for it. That kind of Republican is the Republican that we can never allow to get elected. That brand of Republican is the reason why Colorado is in the position that it's in right now. Always well willing to make compromise. Always willing to cede ground to our enemies. Never willing to dig his heels in and say, this is what I stand for, this is what we're going to do. But not even, not even, the gate hasn't even opened yet. And he's already talking the talk of capitulation, the language of capitulation. We cannot allow that to happen. That should he get elect, should he win the nomination, the likelihood drastically increases that that seat will flip Democrat and go to Mark Snyder. And we cannot have that. We cannot allow Mark Snyder's eight years of voting for gun control. Has he voted right on some of the gun bills? Sure. But at the end of the day, he still has been a strong advocate for gun control. He was actually the prime sponsor of the new bogus concealed carry hand, uh, concealed handgun license regulation bill, him and Monica Duran. So this guy has a history and a record of gun control. He also would give the Democrats another seat in the Senate, which we don't need. We can't have that right now. So it is important that we get the strongest pro-gun candidate in that race elected. And that is Adriana Cuba. Wow. Yeah, a lot of infighting down there in uh, El Paso County. And yeah, really excited for uh, Adriana in her campaign. Uh, really wish her the best there. I think she'll be a great champion when she gets up in the, in the state legislature. We need people like her out there for sure. Absolutely. So this race... Um, hmm. This race has probably sparked the most controversy out of any of the contested primaries that we've seen so far, other than the congressional primaries like Dave Williams. When we're talking specifically state house, this has been a heavily controversial primary. So I mentioned earlier, this is currently held by Senator Jim Smallwood. He's leaving because of term limits. And Representative Lisa Frizzell is running for Senate District 2. Now, Tim Arvidson is her primary challenger. We have endorsed Tim Arvidson. He filled out a 100% survey. He has checked all of our boxes. And there has been a lot of really nasty stuff flying, uh, flying his way from outside dark money groups over the last couple of weeks. There are... There are things where they are greatly exaggerating uh, some of the things on his record. There have been times when he had um, they're, they're claiming that he is a career criminal and that he's committed all these crimes and that he is that he's going to end up in jail as soon as he gets elected. A lot of really crazy stuff. And one of the, the things that they point to is he was charged with a, a felony menacing charge. Now, the question here is, is, what were the circumstances around this? Well, he walked into a Sprouts Ghost grocery store in 2021, was told that he had to wear a mask, and he was arrested because he didn't put a mask on. And they claimed, falsely claimed that he brandished a firearm, which is not true. Falsely claimed he brandished a firearm, 
and then charged him with felony menacing. So here we are seeing the rep so-called Republicans who are supporting Lisa Frizzell that are going and using Jared Polis's flawed justice system as a bludgeon to attack a grassroots pro-gun candidate. That is a serious problem. And the fact of the matter is, is that the justice system is screwed up. We all know this. The government looks for every single opportunity to try to get you in the system. That's how it works. We see what they're doing to President Trump right now. President Trump, they, you know, and all the Democrats are going to beat this drum till the end of time. President Trump was charged with 34 felonies. Okay, were they legit? Or was it a political prosecution? Or was it enforcement of a tyrannical governor's mask order is why this person got arrested. So it's very disturbing to see the way that the, the people that are supporting Lisa Frizzell are grossly distorting the facts when it comes to uh, Tim Arvidsson. And additionally, Lisa Frizzell has never filled out an, a Rocky Mountain gun in her survey. I might take some heat for saying this publicly, but I also don't care. Lisa Frizzell, while she has voted right on every gun bill that's come her way, she has voted right on gun bills that are so extreme that no Republican in their right mind would ever vote wrong on them. No Republican in their right mind would ever vote wrong on an assault weapons ban. No Republican in their right mind would ever vote wrong on a three-day waiting period. Actually, there are some that would, but not in Colorado at the very least. There are, there's no Republican in their right mind that would vote for this incredibly insane gun licensure scheme. So Representative Lisa Frizzell has been in there for two years in the minority, and there are some things about her record that are very concerning. Number one, she has never sponsored a bill to repeal any gun control. Additionally, she has never sponsored any pro-gun legislation like constitutional carry or, uh, you know, getting rid of gun-free zones or anything like that. She's never done that. And additionally, her fight on the House floor this year consisted of a couple 10-minute sound bites. She wasn't up there going to war like Ken DeGraff and Scott Bottoms and Brandy Bradley and even some people, uh, even other representatives, Ron Weinberg, even Ryan Armagas had his moments. There were a lot of representatives that actually got up there and fought and took the time. And quite frankly, she did not do that. She has never taken a stance on constitutional carry. She's never taken a solid stance on how she feels about red flag gun confiscation. She did vote against the red flag expansion, which expanded it drastically, but we don't actually know where she stands. She's never, never filled out our survey and never really taken a solid stance that she will 100% fight against it and make it a top priority to repeal red flag gun confiscation. So now you see a bunch of outside establishment packs coming in at the last minute to assassinate the character of her primary opponent while she is trying to prop herself up. And there are also some non-gun votes that she voted very poorly on. Uh, a big one, and, and while these are not gun issues, they bleed over. They do bleed over. In 2023, she voted to expand the earned income tax credit to illegal aliens. So giving our Tabor refunds, the money that we pay to, that the government steals from us, that it, we are entitled to get back under our constitution, she voted to give that money away to people who don't pay taxes and who have broke the law to come in this country, and even some people who are here committing crimes, contributing to Denver's homelessness and drug problem. And another issue is, is you're incentivizing the very people who go out and purchase these illegal firearms and do these shootings 
and participate in gang violence and violent crime in Denver that gives the Democrats their situations that they can point to to argue for more gun control. Another big issue is that she put her name on Senate Bill, uh, Senate Bill 233, the property tax package. She put her name on Jared, one of Jared Polis's high priority bills. Again, I care about property taxes. It is not a gun issue, but at the same time, Jared Polis has never vetoed a gun control bill. Jared Polis is anti-gun. Is he anti-gun to the point that he wants to ram through an assault weapons ban? No, but he is still anti-gun at the end of the day. He is still radically anti-gun. So I do not trust someone who put their name and worked and um, did the bidding of Jared Polis to represent gun owners well in the state Senate. So Tim Arvidson is the pro-gun choice. He's the only 100% pro-gun candidate in that race. And if you live in Douglas County, you may have seen some texts come through. Make sure you sift through the BS. Don't get polarized by all this stuff that they're trying to say and all these accusations they're making. You have to go down to the meat and potatoes. You have to look at how they vote. You have to look at how these people are voting and what their record is. And Lisa Frizzell's record is not remotely close to good enough to be considered a pro-gun champion. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I'm really glad you, glad you brought up Senate Bill 233 because uh, anybody who's been following Free State Colorado for a while, we've definitely been harping on that. It is not meaningful property tax relief. You know, it's unfortunate we have all these legislators and even the governor coming out and saying they lowered property taxes this year. I, I really urge people to challenge any legislator who comes out and says they actually lowered property taxes during the 2023 legislative session because Senate Bill 233 was not meaningful property tax relief. It's pretty much a joke. The Common Sense Institute has a great report out on the fact that it did not do what they're claiming it does. And, uh, you know, it was really disappointing to see somebody like Representative Frizzell uh, be a co-sponsor, but it really take ownership of that bill, unfortunately. So, and I just got to say, you know, with, with Tim Arvidson, the fact that, you know, he got arrested for not wearing a mask, for not complying with Jared Polis's COVID mandates and really pushing back uh, to that level of individual freedom, resisting the social pressure, resisting, uh, you know, all the mandates and really pushing back against that. I mean, that's, that shows you that the guy's got a spine, at least that's what I would think that he seems like somebody who's not going to back down from a fight and is willing to stand up for what he believes in, even if it means he gets arrested. I mean, that's if you're going to be arrested for anything, resisting the COVID mandates, I feel like is a, is a pretty solid thing to get arrested for. It's hard to believe that any liberty, any pro-liberty person would uh, would have a problem with that. Absolutely. Well, that's what you got for state Senate here. Uh, did you want to take a look at any of the local races at this point? Were there any local races? Yeah, there we that can are... hop into some of the local races because some of these are going to be primaries. So Perfect. the first one, we have uh, Sen uh, Senator Kevin Van Winkle. He is uh, currently the senator for Senate District 30 down in Douglas County. He has been, he served eight years in the House. He is now in his first term in the Senate, and he is now running to replace Laura Thomas. She is vacating her seat to run for House District 43, and now he's running for her seat. Now, he has been a pro-gun champion. He has a proven record. He has a 100% proven record. His opponents, uh, one of his opponents I do know, she's a very nice lady. I, uh, I do believe she is pro-gun. But the big difference is that Kevin Van Winkle has the voting record to back it up. If I am, am if, if two people are put before you, and this is so important, and, and they both claim to be 100% pro-gun, the most important thing you need to do is you need to look at the record. The person with the record is the person who you can trust. The person who does not have the record has not proven themselves yet. So if you have the choice between someone with a bona fide 100% pro-gun champion record, that is the person who you should be choosing for whatever office they're running for. And that is Kevin Van Winkle, and that's why we're supporting him for Douglas County Commission. Oh, definitely. Yeah, Kevin Van Winkle, Senator Van Winkle is a great guy. Uh, when I was a legislative aide back in 2017, I was in the same office as uh, as Representative Van Winkle back then, and, and just a, a solid person, uh, just a great person, somebody 
that everybody should 100% support if you believe in liberty and freedom. You know, I'd like to see him uh, continue on, and I think this is a great opportunity for him, and I really hope Douglas County voters uh, come out in support of, of Senator Kim Van Winkle because he's a really good guy there. Absolutely. And then we have Alicia Gonzalez running for Arapahoe County Commission. That's a general election endorsement. He's taking on Rhonda Fields, who's been one of the biggest enemies of the Second Amendment. She's running for county commission. Uh, Alicio is a actually he's a libertarian. He's one of the libertarians that we're endorsing uh, this election cycle. And I think he has a, a good shot of, of picking up a large swath of support in Arapahoe County. He is a strong pro-gun advocate. He's filled out a 100 percent survey. He's very competent and he's going to be a champion for liberty. So that'll be on your presidential ballot if you live in Arapahoe County. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Alicio, a really good guy, a good friend of mine. I uh, can't say enough good words about him. Definitely one of our liberty leaders here in Colorado. Would love to see him get this position, especially defeating somebody so tyrannical, so authoritarian as Rhonda Fields. So yeah, Alicio, just a great guy. Uh, really encourage people to, to learn more about him. Absolutely. And our final uh, commissioner endorsement is actually going to be for uh, Commissioner Perry Buck in Weld County. Now, Perry, uh, formerly married to uh, former Congressman Ken Buck, she sa served a, uh, some time in the Colorado State Legislature. She was a pro-gun champion. Uh, she worked Dudley Brown when he was at the helm of RMGO, worked very closely with Perry. She did everything that we needed her to do, and she has been a strong voice for the Second Amendment on the Weld County Commission. So we are encouraging all of our members in Weld County to get out there and support Perry for her reelection. Uh, she is the type of person that we need people like her, like Senator Kevin Van Winkle, to be standing up against Denver and saying, in our county, you don't get to do that kind of garbage. So that's why it's so important that we secure our county commissions. Yeah, definitely a little torn on this one. You know, Perry has definitely been a great champion, uh, a wonderful person, one of the nicest people you'll ever meet, somebody that you, you can trust with with anything, a uh, great person. But uh, I got to say, Lori Sane, who's also running for Wealth County Commissioner, is a, is a good friend as well and definitely a champion for liberty. So that's my two cents. Uh, a little surprised, honestly, to see RMGO pick one over the other. But, you know, uh, that's what you got to do. Um, but nonetheless, we'll see what happens. Absolutely. So the last one I want to move on to is uh, district attorney. And this is, again, another one of the really, really brutal primaries that we're seeing. So Senator Kevin Van Winkle uh, last year ran a bill, I mean, it was either last year or the year before, to create a new judicial district in Colorado. So this new judicial district is splitting off from what is now the 18th judicial district. So the 18th judicial district is Arapahoe, Douglas. Uh, I believe it goes out to Lincoln County and Elbert too. The new judicial district, though, is going to be just Douglas, Lincoln, and Elbert County. So it will be a strongly Republican judicial district. And... We have two candidates that are running. This is going to be one of the most, probably the highest profile district attorney race in the state. We have Dagny Vanderyot, who we are supporting. She is a constitutional attorney from Castle Rock. She has defended uh, people previously who have been arrested for using their uh, their guns to defend themselves, using their Second Amendment right to defend themselves and their family. She has represented them as a constitutional and criminal defense attorney. And she ha has filled out a 100% survey and she is 100% on board, not just with our, with our gun rights, but with everything else that we care about. What we see here in the issue that we see a lot of times with district attorneys is you got the you got the Soros funded district attorneys who will just sit back and say, oh, yeah, you know, we're going to we're just going to let people steal cars and it's all going to be OK and not prosecute anything. And then you have the other side of the coin where you have the uh, incarceration happy district attorneys where they will find anything and everything to throw you in jail so they can say I imprisoned X amount of criminals whenever they're up for re-election. 
And that person, that persona, perfectly fits her opponent, former district attorney and former statewide attorney general candidate George Brockler. Now, George Brockler has had a lot of time in Colorado politics. He was actually the lead attorney who prosecuted James Holmes after the Aurora shooting. George Brockler previously was the district attorney for the 18th Judicial District. He stepped aside to run for attorney general, and now, a couple, now six years later, he's trying to hop back in for relevance. Now, they, George Brockler has a very, very, very long rap sheet. George Brockler, back in 2018, assisted Democrats, the, Demo uh, the former Democrat Speaker Alec Garnett and Rhino Republican Cole Wist in writing the first draft of Colorado's red flag gun confiscation bill. We actually ended up filing a Colorado Open Records Act against George Brockler, and we were able to obtain email communications between him, Sheriff Tony Spurlock in Douglas County, who was a major gun grabber, and Representative Cole Wist and Alec Garnett. George Brockler also attended the press conference when the bill was introduced, and he told Rocky Mountain PBS that gun owners should be kind of cautious about it, but that red flag gun confiscation would fix, and this is a quote directly from him, would fix a status quo that isn't working and that people shouldn't look at it as a gun bill, but they should look at it as a mental health bill. Well, Republicans still held the Senate in 2018. After the 2018 elections, they took back the Senate. Cole Wist was replaced by Tom Sullivan. Cole Wist and George Brockler's work on the red flag gun confiscation bill is a major reason why we actually have Tom Sullivan in that seat now. Tom Sullivan had run for office two or three times before, and he had gotten beaten every single time. Bad. Badly beaten. This time, Cole Wist disgusted so many Republicans in Arapahoe County that he ended up getting his brakes beaten off of him by Tom Sullivan in that election. So that is a big reason why we have that. After Cole Wist lost, Tom Sullivan and Alec Garnett would just run the same bill that they ran in 2018, expand it a little bit, and then go ahead and pass it through both chambers and eventually get signed into law by Jared Polis. So George Brockler is a big reason why we have red flag gun confiscation here in the state of Colorado. Despite him pretending to be a tough on crime law and order Republican, he has worked with some of the strongest anti-gun voices in our state to create what is now our red flag gun confiscation law. Yeah, I mean, the proof is in the pudding, you know, as much as he wants to deny it. I actually challenged him recently on uh, back in April on Twitter. You know, I've seen those uh, same core requests here just to go back to a, a quick little Twitter interaction I had with George Brockler from Free State Colorado. You know, he said uh, he's never taken an anti-Second Amendment position. I said, didn't you help Cole Wist, Wist write the gun red gun flag? Uh, excuse me. Didn't you help Cole Wist write the red flag gun confiscation bill in 2018? Or am I mistaken? He says, I didn't help write anything. I did what I could to try and fix a bad bill to make it constitutional. Now, if you ask me, <laughs> if it was a bad bill that was unconstitutional, that wasn't going to get passed, you know, if you're making it constitutional, you're making a bad bill better, you're making it more likely to get passed, you're making it more likely to become law. And unfortunately, we're living in that world now where we have red flag gun confiscation. And it's unfortunate. Uh, people need to understand that George Brockler was there when the conversation first started and tried to make it more palatable, tried to make it get passed at the time. So, you know, the proof is in the pudding. There's no hiding around it. Uh, big talk is big talk, but the reality is there, folks. And the fact of the matter is, is the fact that he said, oh, well, I tried to make it constitutional. That's the same line that Dan Crenshaw used whenever he said that we need to that we pass red flag laws. He said we need to pass constitutional red flag laws. Well, I hate to tell you that constitutional red flag laws don't exist. No world, no matter how much, you know, how much lipstick you put on the pig that is red flag gun confiscation, taking someone's property out of their house based on a tip with no due process, with no criminal conviction, with no opportunity for them to face their accuser, with 
no opportunity for a trial to simply allow the government to bust your door down in the middle of the night because someone claims that you're unstable, there is no way to make that constitutional. There is no way. So the fact that he even says, oh, well, I tried to make a constitutional red flag law, that's just a cop out and garbage. And he got so much hell for it. He ended up losing his attorney general's race. He was the closest statewide race back in 2018. I think he only ended up losing by four points to Phil Weiser, Lord help us. And now, all of a sudden, after losing the election and now running for election again, oh, I never I never supported uh, red flag gun confiscation. It is <laughs> it is so incredibly asinine that the National Rifle Association is going to endorse against him. If that wow. if that gives you any sort of gauge. He is such a hack and such a liar. And he has called myself and Taylor Rhodes and Rocky Mountain gun owners and other people, anyone who dare bring up the red flag bill of 2018, pathological liars and that we support Democrats. He has said on multiple occasions, he said that uh, RMGO supports giving guns to rapists, which is com absolutely untrue, complete fault, completely garbage. And he's saying that uh, they, he said some other really, really wild things. I think it got to one point where he uh, on Twitter told our account, he said that we need to stop, uh, stop smoking out of an AR-15 shaped bong. He said that as a Republican candidate running for office. So he is a pathological liar. He is a scumbag, slimy attorney. All he wants to do is get power so he can be relevant again, so he can run for governor in 2026. That is what this is all about. This has nothing to do with him wanting to make Douglas County or the 23rd Judicial District a better place. And the thing is that is the most concerning is that he has never taken a stance on whether he would prosecute someone if they – were in possession of an unserialized firearm. He has never pledged to prosecute, not to prosecute someone if they're a, if they're in possession of a fifteen round magazine. Now I called him out on it a couple of weeks ago. He goes, oh, I've never prosecuted someone like that. Okay, just because you haven't doesn't mean you won't. So like, I oppose that law. Great. There are many sheriffs who oppose red flag gun confiscation, but are still enforcing it. And Dagny Vandergott, our candidate has pledged that she will not prosecute someone for being in possession of a 15 uh, of a magazine greater than 15 rounds. So yeah. George Brockler cannot be trusted. He is not pro gun, not at all. And I think gun owners need to definitely be on guard should he get elected, but we're going to do our absolute damnness to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean it's it's great that there's an organization like out there like Rocky Mountain Gun Owners and so many other liberty organizations trying to hold these politicians accountable, right? Because campaign season comes along and all the politicians talk about how they're the greatest person on earth, how they're the most liberty oriented person, how they're going to solve all of our problems and repeal all the taxes and they're going to stand up for our rights. But when you look at the records, when you look at the reality of it, and you look at what they're committed to doing. Uh, you know, it's a different story. So we need organizations like RMGO, the Political Action Committee specifically, and other groups out there really trying to hold these politicians accountable, keep track of their records, and let the voters know because it's tough. I mean, these are going to be big ballots this year. There's a lot of choices, a lot of people to vote for, a lot of initiatives coming up. So being able to sort through it all and really see that somebody's doing that vetting and somebody's really pushing uh, this issue forward and holding these politicians accountable based on it, it's such an important thing. I got to say, too, you know, I'm a big Ayn Rand fan, uh, a fan, of course, you know, from uh, Atlas Shrugged and Dagny Taggart of Taggart Transcontinental. So it'd be, it's amazing that we can have here in Colorado a, a pro-liberty candidate with the name Dagny. That's just that's just too cool. Absolutely. One hundred percent. Well, that's all I got, at least for our primary endorsements. Thanks so much for having me on. And if you or any of your listeners have any questions, uh, we are going to be. Uh, you can go to rmgo.org slash endorsement, and you can find the sh who we're going to be backing in the primaries in 2024, as well as the general election. Awesome. 
Well, really appreciate your time, Ian. Really look forward to getting together with you and all the other uh, pro gun people at the big banquet coming up here. I'll try and get this out as quick as I can and uh, let people know what's going on and who are the proven pro gun champions out there. And uh, really important, especially with our gun rights at risk more and more every year, it seems. Absolutely. 100%. Thank you so much for having me and let's keep fighting. Awesome. All right. Take care.